And the first team, uh, please prepare yourself. Crepas, are you here? Let me just check if, if okay, yes, 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 you guys are here. Can I? Yes, I got an inquiry from the team that they want to record um, their pitch. So, um, Shivin, can you um, uh, permission to record? Hello? Yes, so uh, uh, our session is actually recording. So, um, yeah, yeah, but they, they need their parts. No, no, no. Actually, this is just one day before the Chuseok vacation. So some of my members already started. So just in case. So if everything is recorded, then the necessary. We will share later. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Can I, I share mean, my screen? <clears throat> sure. Yes. I you mean, I, uh, yes, I am actually having trouble uh, entering the room uh, Dreamplex. There is, the, this requires password. I don't have any password. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, Karpas, you can go on uh, for the business briefing. And Jimin, can you help uh, Likon? Yes, I'm All gonna right. message you privately and... All right. And then uh, hi, I'm also having trouble getting into Dreamplex. Yep, so uh, for the teams assigned for Dreamplex, uh, we're going to um, share the passcode on the okay. chatting. So okay, please, thanks. Yeah, please uh, be muted and then uh, we're going to listen to the business briefing of Krapas. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the opportunity and the, that's a very great session yesterday and today. I would like to share some of my uh, our ideas with you. So I selected a couple of pages from our uh, presentation before. Um, uh, actually, we are approaching some financial inclusion, some equal, equal access to the financial sector. So uh, to resolve that problem, our solution is not just focusing on financial historical information, which is traditionally used. We wanted to expand the data area. So we wanted to use more data for evaluate, uh, well, younger generation, foreigners, housewives, etc. So this is our the main idea. So this is our uh, main business logic. So we developed a platform, they integrated uh, the whole things together. Actually, we wanted to help financial or non-financial platform to make a better decision through data. So to make this possible, then every data should be integrated in here. Then everybody may understand that each data has different noise, different type, and even different value. So we wanted to analyze all the info information together and developing some of features that, uh, well, analysts can use or apply for the analytic-based decision solution. So, uh, well, analysts can develop each custom models or decision rules with uh, this big data, or we can provide uh, some off-the-shelf standard model for the decision. So we wanted to starting from the Korean market and covering the smaller financial sector, which it, uh, doesn't have a good uh, analytics team internally. So we wanted to helping them and to cover the special finance for youth uh, and wanted to expand that to the globally and to supporting from Korea to global. So we are a type of B2B uh, platform, but uh, this is a different type. So someone can use only data from us or analytics from us or someone can use the full service processing from us. So those are what we wanted to develop. In. So this is some ch challenges and on the basis of challenges, our approach of this uh, year. Uh, well, in only this year, there is a new regulation as uh, proven. So it's a type of, uh, well, the new type of business is uh, appear, can be appeared uh, thanks to the new regulation. 
So uh, we can develop some alternative database to the regular credit bureau in Korean market. But to make this, we needed to, uh, to match some of the requirements which government uh, well, regulation require. So we are preparing some of the physical things and data system things as well as process and personal things. So those of uh, technical investment is one of the challenges that, of, uh, that we faced in this year. Uh, and it's uh, the preparation time, so type of R&D, so not effect to, uh, actually for the business process. But uh, the, the other two things are what we would like to focus on in this year. The second part is uh, now we're starting from the financial data plus uh, social uh, Android data, but we wanted to expand it to the multiple data source. But to make this, uh, then we needed to meet people and doing some of uh, discussion for the business model develop. But in this year, lots of things are just limited. So it's a little bit slow down. So our, one of our target to expanding this part in this year is uh, at least three more new data sources we wanted to acquire in this year. So that is uh, uh, what we wanted to do uh, in the Impact Collective. And the last one is global expansion. We were selected as uh, uh, the special program from Shinhan, fin Shinhan Financial Group, which is uh, Shinhan Futures Lab for uh, global business. So if there's nothing happened, then we should be in Vietnam in March and May to developing some more partnership. Uh, we just uh, transited to uh, the online basis things, but uh, well, a lot of uh, online communication was happened, but in terms of progress, there was not, uh, nothing uh, well, happened so far. So we wanted to accelerate in that part. So at least to uh, get uh, three more new POC cases in this year is uh, what we would like to achieve with you. So in this program, I mean. So, so those are what uh, I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, as already just, you know, we used all five minutes. So I'd like to go for the, for the next team, but um, the partners, do you guys have any questions regarding the KPIs and challenges? If nothing for the, uh, for now, then we'll, we'll move on to the next team. And thank you very much for the Kerpas team. Um, so the next team will be um, River of Life. Is it, um, it Tella? No, River of River of Life. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, it's Tella. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right, can you hear me well? Yep. Okay. Um, right. Uh, can you see my um, presentation? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Yuha Jin from Tela, and um, we provide English personal training. So uh, English empowers many people, as you know, and there's a um, growing global digital English education market, mm -hmm. uh, growing 20% per year on average. Um, however, currently there's a market gap um, between what the learner's needs are and uh, what the market provides. Uh, number one is the awkward learning experience, especially for Asian or East Asian uh, students where just um, interacting or speaking in English is very awkward and um, nerve-wracking. So there's a psychological aspect. Second is, is it effective? So the speaking lessons that are currently available, such as telephone English or Skype English, um, although they do help, but we are going to provide even a more effective solution. And the third gap is standardized learning. So now with the help of technology, they, there can be more personalization, but currently um, the learning is more standardized. So we're, we're solving all of these three problems and uh, providing English personal training. So I'll show you how we do it. So we do this by texting or chat-based learning. So currently we provide a 25-minute chat lesson uh, with a native English tutor, uh, 
communicating with the student and correcting all of the students' English sentences, whether it's grammar or expressions. Uh, we have topics, um, curriculum for this, which you can choose by your preference of topic, level, et cetera. And we also um, recommend based on analysis. Um, yeah, so how this uh, chat lesson uh, solves these problems is actually the psychological barrier is very low. So you can think about even maybe dating or becoming friends with people. Um, initially, like if you're not familiar with them, you don't really want to, you know, talk, start Skyping or calling or Zooming with them, right? So chat will be more, I guess, um, the barrier is lower. That's, how, that's the reason why uh, a lot of people come to us. Um, in the past, they used telephone English where the barrier was high and they couldn't sustain learning, whereas a chat, they can. And they don't have to think about people listening into their calls in public spaces or stuff like that because it's chat. They can do it anywhere in the subway, bus, or even the office. Yeah, so this is um, actually our ads. Secondly, um, is it effective? Is it actually going to improve your English proficiency in speaking? Um, there's a research done where actually chat lessons increase the prof English speech proficiency the most, even more so than telephone or voice-based lessons. And we are seeing results from our customers. Um, because we do the data analysis, we can see that they achieve uh, more proficiency than just voice lessons. Third is personalization. So because it's chat-based, we, um, we can provide this kind of uh, review function. And also, we provide analysis based on, so we analyze their chat data. So we show their vocabulary level, how much they achieved um, during this period of time, et cetera. And we're doing this, um, we provide a monthly report as well. So, so many people gain their confidence through chat. And now we have um, launched a voice lesson as well, which is um, combined with a chat lesson. So this chat lesson is the main service we provide. But once you gain the confidence, you can actually try speaking the, the um, what you learned through chat. And um, yeah, so the main value that we provide to our customers is mostly the positive learning cycle. Because English um, learning or edu English education has kind of like a negative learning cycle where um, it's kind of like going to the gym. So you, it's not always positive. You make a goal, but you kind of have that um, experience of failure. Um, so we're breaking that cycle and giving a positive and fun experience. And actually, they're seeing their results through data, through the effectiveness, through personalization. Um, and we believe text-based learning is the future because it's the easiest form of data to analyze and personalize the learning experience. And also, so much of communication now is actually through text. Uh, thanks to the um, post-corona era, um, a lot of communication is actually done in text. So it's, it's linked to their daily communication as well. Um, yeah, so we provide on-demand learning. You can choose a tutor time and course for every single lesson. Um, we sh are very transparent about the uh, tutors and programs. Sorry. Um, so far, uh, we mainly targeted um, people in their 20s and 30s that um, are working. We're now going to the teens and people that live in English speaking countries. And we have all these so long testimonials where they really um, felt the, the, um, the fun of learning and actual results. And so we, and the most thing we're proud of is the attendance rate is actually 94% currently, which is kind of um, impossible when you think about online learning where you usually give up. So um, you can see that it's actually fun. Oh, well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll stop here. So I'll, I'm going to give you this extra one minute to oh, cover okay. the challenges and KPIs. Actually, that is the most important part of today's briefing. Okay, so I'll be quick. So um, out of the free trial users, um, five out of, uh, sorry, one out of five uh, free trial users actually purchase for our service, which is very high compared to the other competitors. And we have a, a lifetime um, value about $300, and this is increasing. Um, we have 7,000 paid users so far. And right now, we're almost break even. We have passed the monthly break even. Um, and the quality factors of our service is actually getting better every month. 
Um, and we do have B2B clients as well, such as PUBG, uh, eBay, Koika, um, Samsung Electronics, et cetera. Um, yeah, so we're growing and we're seeking for investment. We're also um, seeking to go global next year as soon as we can, especially into Asian countries. So we would love to seek for uh, future partnerships here. And oh, I, also we got B Corp certified last year. Yeah, so um, uh, I'll, I'll stop here now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And um, if you can, um, you know, give us some more um, information about the challenges and the three um, like top KPIs for uh, the quarter four of 2020, then uh, we'll also reflect it to the next um, calls and other, you know, KPI tracking session as well. Okay. Um, so main thing we're trying to tackle right now is increasing the ratio between cost of acquisition and um, the lifetime value. So right now it's about 250 or 2.5, but um, we want to in increase this to more than three, 300. Um, mm -hmm. or, so that's our goal. I'm not sure if we can achieve it in the 10 weeks, but that's our next six month goal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the second one is we want to increase our monthly revenue. Right now it's about uh, 40, 400, uh, sorry, not 40,000 to 50,000 US dollars, but we want to definitely surpass 50,000 US dollars per month. Um, so those are our largest, uh, biggest goals. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have one questions. Sure. Yeah, do you have, uh, what kind of help do you expect uh, throughout this impact collective programs? Um, so, uh, number one um, thing, I right now I'm actually seeking for investment um, at this point, so that's one thing, but also uh, I really want to get some information or insight to go global. Next year we're thinking about um, mainly Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, or and other countries, in, mostly in Asia, that, want, uh, that have um, a market need. So I'm, I'm trying to, I would love to get some more insight on that. And um, one, one more thing is our, actually our impact um, is job creating um, on the East African Rwandan side. And that's how we actually started in the beginning. Um, uh, however, on, when we're doing marketing, we don't really use this because um, we don't think uh, people in this market really want to, you know, invest in the, um, when they're purchasing educational products, I'm not thinking, I'm, I don't think they're looking for, you know, this necessarily. So, uh, but we do want to kind of leverage this um, value that we have for marketing um, or for um, more global recognition. So I would love to have some advice or um, on how to do so as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Right. Okay, Rezi, you're up next. Um, let, and, and let's try to keep the time. I Please, uh, I'm going to raise this. If you see stop, you must stop. Okay. Cool. Um, can everyone see my screen and hear me okay? Yes. And uh, another tip that we um, I'm going to share is that, you know, this is the not a uh, no more pitching session because yeah. we already uh, go through all the uh, pitch decks and brief introductions on your applications so you can focus on the four key questions that we gave you yep okay no problem cool um i'm jacob from resi um resi is a resume software and it also helps companies hire based on the user profiles so um we kind of like believe this, that we can help companies hire more effectively if we can help candidates create a better resume. So it all starts with the resume for us. Um, with that being said, for those who don't know, um, Resi is a resume focused SaaS and it helps companies find qualified talent. Um, we have some really interesting technology that makes a fantastic resume, uh, specifically our AI keyword targeting, 
the job seeker can upload a job description. Resi will tell exactly which keyword should be in the resume content to get an interview for the position. Um, and this is really interesting. We built a system like Grammarly, which automatically reviews resume content. And per day, we have about 18,000 bullet points that are reviewed automatically. Um, so as we start to scale, we really depend on our technology to provide a great experience for the job seekers. Um, so talking a little bit more about our business model, we are a SaaS for our consumer where they can upgrade for premium features. Um, and what's new with Resi is called the Resi Network, where once you create a good enough resume, you can send it to hundreds of companies with just one click. And this is really cool because this is the future of us helping people get jobs. Uh, for the B2B side, we have we built a search engine that allows our hiring partners to access the resumes of those who opt in to Resi helping them get a job. And this is a subscription for companies. Um, so our Q4 KPIs for this program would be to get around 20,000 new users and to make around $45,000 in new uh, revenue. Our monthly growth rate is 20% and we hope to continue that growth rate throughout the program. Uh, this is our current traction. We're growing really fast actually. Um, in August, we had like 45,000 users sign up in a couple days which is really cool. Um, our annual recurring revenue is healthy and we're growing by word of mouth in engineering rather than marketing. So that's really cool too. So um, if we think about like how we're going to achieve these KPIs for Q4, uh, the biggest one is strategy. Um, or sorry, the biggest strategy is the networking. So we've kind of like engineered scalable viral growth and it's essentially giving away the resume software and the upgraded resi um, subscription for free. And that's kind of where we see the jumps in the graph. And we're also ranked really high on Google. And the other one, of course, is global expansion. Um, as an online SaaS product, by nature, we're all over the world. We have users in 182 countries, which might be all of them, I don't know. Um, but we're really excited to see like how we can expand our global footprint throughout this program. Uh, challenges. So this is probably what you guys care most about. Um, Resi is experiencing difficulties in fundraising uh, since we're in South Korea. Um, our team is, we don't have anyone Korean on our team, so it's really hard to find innovative global investors. Um, I'm seeing a very big lack in diversity among investors. And also it's difficult to find investors with experience with global founders. I think those three are the biggest things that are creating a challenge for us. Uh, the second challenge is we face the risk of moving too slowly as a result of bootstrapping. Um, the job market is historically active with the coronavirus, a uh, new technology like GPT-3 just came out. And as a result of bootstrapping, we're also not allowed or able to hire the best talent who wants to work for us. So over the course of the next uh, however so many weeks, we hope to overcome these challenges with your guys' help. Uh, this is the team, myself and Luke. We have two people and we're also, we will, yeah, okay. Um, I'll stop it there and you guys can ask any questions if you want. Thank you. Any questions from our partners? All right. Cool. All right yeah, thank I, you. yeah, I think uh, we got your um, form responses as well. Oh, no, not yet. All right. Um, Team Resi, please um, submit the form that we shared in this morning. That way we can keep the data and keep, keep track of the key challenges and KPIs with you guys and uh, set some goals for our you know, uh, next 10 weeks of the course. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, the next team is um, 
Feels good. Um, do we have who's good here? If they're not here, we can move on and then we'll just move their slot back down. Yeah, I think Will was talking something, but he's muted. Will? All right, then uh, we'll go to uh, JJ and companies. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm in trouble with uh, sharing my Screen. presentation. Yep. So, uh, um, if you can send the file on the chat, then we can share the screen on behalf of you. Okay. Chat. Um, okay. Okay, uh, JJ and companies, uh, we'll give you some more time to work on this technical issue. So um, you can, um, you know, whenever you are ready, just let us know. And I'll just move on to River of Life instead if they're here. Right. Sorry for that. Oh, no problem. So the team River of Life. Hello. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, we have problem share our screen too. Okay, can, um, you think can you give them the access or permission? Great, everyone should have access to share screen. Um, do you have, what, what, are you not able to share? Oh, it's our system preference. We have kind of like. Okay. If you guys think that you will also face a problem, something like this, because of your uh, system preference, why don't you share your slide with me, and I can share I can share the screen, and you will have less of a problem. Um, share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Share it. Okay. Okay. I'll ask my boss to share this with email to you and. Oh. Okay. Uh, then yeah, you can send the doc uh, via email to Jimin. I'll write my email in the chat. Okay. So everyone, please just send me your slides here, and I'll just um, share the slide. Yep, in the meantime, we'll go to Open Ocean Engineering team. Hi. Hi. Uh, can, I, can I share my screen? Is that- Sure, sure. You'll find the, yeah, the button. <clears throat> I'm just trying to present this. 
Yeah. Uh, so hi, um, uh, uh, I'm from Open Ocean Engineering, and we're building Clearbot, uh, which is water trash collecting robot swarms. Um, so the problem today actually is that most of the trash that is being collected from the water is collected by either hands or fishing nets. The Hong Kong government alone is spending 70 million Hong Kong dollars uh, on marine refuse collection uh, through these fishing boats that you can see in the picture. And th this is a very inefficient process. Moreover, there are no such tools for like scalable different types of water. There are no such tools that are scalable for like rivers or even like smaller water bodies like lakes, etc. <clears throat> Moreover, some, some areas is, uh, like these pictures you see are from Indonesia are so trash dense that motor boats cannot be used because trash gets collected within, within those motors. So people use paddle boats to do the collection. Um, now this is a global crisis. Uh, it's, it's all over the world which is where we see a global opportunity. There are many indu industries already, such as uh, city municipal governments, yacht marinas, waterside resorts, harbors, and construction projects that are already paying contractors to clean water. So here we see like a huge opportunity to provide a better solution, which is why we are providing Clearboard, a system of trash collecting ocean drawings. Clearboard is a self-navigating, self-charging swarm robotics system that leverages AI vision on board uh, to collect trash. Our value proposition is that we are two times cheaper, five time, have five times more reach and collect four times more trash uh, from the current uh, solutions that are already there. And in the process, we generate a lot of data. The, the magic behind it is the, deep, is the deep tech aspect of our startup. We have one of the most cutting edge AI trash detection uh, models and we, we, we detect over 64 classes of uh, trash. And we've trained our model over this year, over tens of thousands of images. Uh, we've hacked the aerial drone technology. We've adapted it to work on ocean surfaces, which allows us to build swarm robotic systems. And also we can navigate on uh, autonomously uh, very accurately. And we are backed by uh, the leaders in HKU, such as the AI Vision Lab, Innovation Wing, and Maker Bay in Hong Kong. And the technology has the potential to be patented. Throughout this year, we've gone through uh, various iterations of testing and development and to reach the current product that we have at the moment. And, uh, and Clearbot is now even customizable in terms of the size, in terms of the frame. Uh, and we've made it as robust as possible. To date, Clearbot has been tested various number of times uh, in Hong Kong at Repulse Bay. And we've tested not just our robot, but we've also tested our docking mechanism as well as our A trash AI detection. In terms of the business model, there are two aspects. Uh, one is a service business model where we provide uh, Clearbot as a service to marinas and harbors in Hong Kong. Whereas there's a corporate offset model where we partner with corporates uh, who are generating the trash or that to, to sort of offset using plastic credits. We have partnered with, with the right people through the right channels uh, to develop a great go-to-market uh, strategy. <clears throat> we've, we've also recently um, signed an MOU with Repurpose Global from, from the United States. That's a plastic credit rec recovery company and they'll help us uh, execute our plastic credit recovery business model. We've also, uh, we've also been uh, uh, sort of, you know, developing our, our pilot with Surabaya City uh, for the two given locations uh, on the slide. Uh, and we'll be testing our uh, robot for collection as well as trash AI uh, in both these locations. We've also partnered with Incubation Network uh, for, for our pilot support in Surabaya. Uh, apart from that, we've been partnering with uh, Idendron and Maker Bay in Hong Kong for working spaces, design and fabrication of the robot, and a lot of NGO partnerships in Hong Kong itself. In comparison to our competitors, uh, we are a lot more affordable. Uh, we have the right uh, collection capacity and uh, the compact size for our, uh, for our robot for scaling to different uh, water bodies. <clears throat> As for our goals, our KPI, uh, 
we count our success on uh, being able to deliver the pilots, uh, especially the one in Surabaya. And also we, uh, we aim to have Clearboard in continuous deployment over there for about two months. As for our needs, uh, we are desperately looking for docking space in Hong Kong. And, and we really want to get introduced to, uh, to different marinas, uh, yacht marinas in Hong Kong itself. Uh, we are also looking out for sponsorships uh, for sponsoring Clearboard, the robot itself, as well as sponsorships for research and development within Clearboard. Uh, in the past year, we've also won a lot of awards, uh, including the Grand Global Challenges Summit in London, the Alibaba Jumpstarter Competition, and uh, the Microsoft AI for Earth grant. We've uh, also appeared in the media here a couple of times, and um, and um, yeah, we are only aiming to go forward with this. This is our team. Uh, Sidhan, who is uh, unfortunately not on the call today, is the founder. I am the lead engineer of the project. And we also have a, a lot of technical advisors um, who, are, who are pioneers in their field, Professor Edmund Lamb uh, and Hayden So, uh, Dr. Hayden So, who are directly um, advising us as well. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, the time is off, so yeah. we are a bit rushing into the next team because we are a bit behind the timeline. So uh, for the questions, um, oh, I mean, the partners, do you guys have any questions? I mean, we can have just one single question for this team. Yeah, I have a quick question, actually. Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, <clears throat> How do you solve your um, the battery problem? Um, how long does it last, and um, is it uh, economically uh, sustainable? I mean, uh, economically um, um, cost-effective rather than um, using um, the traditional solutions. Thank you. That's that's actually a very great question, and that's a completely valid question to ask. So, from our testing, so so far, we've used. Uh, from the robot, from the robot's capacities uh, on the bat for the battery, we've managed to get eight hours of single single charge usage, and uh, we we feel that it's a lot more economically feasible because uh, at the present time, there's the recovery cost is almost three hundred thousand US dollars a ton, whereas we are able to do it a lot more cost effectively uh, to about two hundred US dollars a ton, and. Um, um, putting in the disposal cost, which is almost the same, same I feel, uh, we are able to uh, be a lot more cost effective than the current solutions out there. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And the next stop is... Jimin. Is it JJ or who's good? Let's uh, let's do JJ because we have the slide ready here. Okay. JJ, are you ready? Yes. Is it loud and clear? Mm hmm Okay. Uh, then let me start. Okay. Uh, we are an ocean engineering company who is developing integrate control system with AI, AI for aquaculture system and our product uh, name is Triangle. So while well, we are building and developing a system to control the aquaculture farms in your hands. Yeah, based on our experience of all offshore plant process engineering. So we are going to transfer our core technologies like uh, system integration, power management, and the monitoring and control to aquaculture products. Uh, currently in Korea, um, some Asia has uh, problems with the aquaculture because the old peoples are running a small farm. So that is not um, productive enough and there are lack of uh, manpower things like that especially in Korea the aging is very big problems in uh, fisheries 
So we thought that we could uh, help this with uh, our technology. Uh, based on our uh, technology, we made uh, five different uh, product lines and we have made one, uh, the triangle one for a simple remote control system and our camera system with uh, augmented reality and AI will be released in next month, October. And we are developing the other three things in the different uh, time timeline. But uh, to proceed our our project, we need to uh, overcome some things. The first, oh, it is very hard to get the local support because I was not from a fisherman or, or fishing village. So when I go to the fishing village to have our own facility, the local people are very reluctant to have uh, strangers in this uh, village. Even they need the young people to work with them, but they are not so uh, happy with uh, strangers. On the other hand, if we could get some support from local people or local uh, governments, finally, we, we need to have uh, approval by uh, central government. We, it is called uh, Ministry of uh, Fisheries and Oceans, but it is also time consuming. And uh, the, the worst thing is the market. The aquaculture uh, business is very uh, cost consuming, but due to the COVID-19, the normal fishermen are very reluctant to invest the money to have a better backslider system. So uh, those three things are our the biggest challenge. So uh, for me, it was very hard to set KPI for this year, 2020, because our sales has been collapsed uh, almost nothing. So we made a three uh, practical KPI for uh, by the end of this year. One is a fundraising uh, of uh, investment. So our target is uh, achieving more than 500,000 US dollars for uh, investment. And the next thing is we are going to, we are almost uh, complete developing our AI and AR underwater camera. So we are going to launch this product um, end of October, but it will be very hard to have a sales from this year. So, uh, just our practical KPI is for market release of this product. And finally, the a whole year we are uh, trying to have our own test field, but finally we could uh, several candidate places that we could have our own test field. So once we could have a test field, we can test and develop our own uh, the integrated aquaculture system. So. Uh, those three things are our practical KPI for this year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and just on time. Mm -hmm. Any questions from our partners? So if you secure 500 US dollar, um, is it possible to um, own your own um, a farm, how to say, yeah? Yeah, I, I, I guess so. So that was our basis of uh, fundraising. We guess we totally we need about two million US dollars and we have some cashes. But, uh, once we could have uh, $500,000 for investment, then we could have uh, about a million, half of them as a loan and the rest of them could be uh, supported by local government. So. Uh, Based on this calculation, our target for fundraising is 500,000 for this year. Okay, thanks Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, River of Life, are you ready? Yep. Did you receive our email? Yes. Okay. Can we start? Yes. 
Hi, everybody. We are Mama You Can from The Roof Life, and we are cross generation parenting technology and social innovation from China. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, having grandparents look after a newborn is very common in Asia. The conflict is often between young parents and grandparents on how to take care of their grandchildren. Now, as long as grandmother subscribes our mini program on WeChat and fills in the information about baby's date of birth, and the mini program of Mama You Can will automatically work and will inform scientific knowledges, and this will provide an equal chance for working class families and the elders. It will provide um, online education for rural communities, um, including sending daily customized voice messages of early education related tasks to guide today's parenting just like Siri. And this includes six dialects people can choose. Of course, in Chinese, right? Um, for families who have subscribed, there will also be multiple parenting classes, each lasting about 20 minutes, while they can be better informed. And our business model is scalable for both B2C and C2C model. The instruction th through AI is the core of our mini program. Next slide, please. Thank you. And we currently have three main challenges. The first one is we need to test our growth hacking. Our product has been proved. Now we need to promote to different regions, our community in China. Um, it takes effort to meet a standard of diversity. So we need to spend time, money, and energy. It's very hard. The second is our challenges building our team. Um, our program is totally new to the market, so we have great pressure facing the terrible condition of COVID-19 virus and the lack of funds to support. We need to build our confidence and make our team a military-ish group. And the third is to measure the influence. We need to measure our influence, and the one of the most valuable way is to track some parents and grandparents, asking them about their kids. However, it is so hard to measure if the kids has already changed or not. Um, and we need more resources and more expertise people to assist us doing this. But this, this goal needs tons of work. It needs energy, money, and time. Yeah. Next slide, please. Our goal for Q4 is measured in OKR, which is known as objectively, uh, objective key result. Our first objective is to test out efficient methods of to increase users, which is the growth hacking. Our first KR is to growth hack 30,000 30, households in three months. Our second KR is expecting pay rate of these families is 10%. Our third KR is monthly income will be higher than our monthly customer acquisition spending. Our second objective is to continuously iterate our products to successfully help users. Our first KR is to test our user NPS value, NPS which is net promoter score. Our second KR is to establish volunteered experiences, experiencers, which are people, users, re, user research groups um, through social networks, for example, WeChat or WhatsApp, something like that, to track changes in user families and children and to collect user stories, which, it, which that I said that we can promote our growth. And the third objective is to build an entrepreneurial team that can develop, develop our new market. The first KR is to share and export our program's mission and experience to attract more talent's attention. So we hope to do it once a week. And the second KR is to improve interview and selection ability. Our current recruitment and competence rate is 20%, which is too small, and we expect to increase it to 40%. And third KR is to continue to promote business to achieve sustained revenue, which is kind of like a challenge also. And the four, fourth KR is to provide our team more training resources and opportunities, um, at least once every two days for collective mutual training or third-party training. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. I think you've um, studied a lot on OKRs and uh, perfectly set the um, you know, uh, three measurements for each objectives. Um, but there will be some other, you know, um, 
deeper conversations for the measurements and how to measuring the KP uh, OKRs. So um, for that, we'll, uh, I'll, I would rather have another follow on chat. Uh, but uh, before we go for another team, um, any partners, do you guys have any questions regarding the team? So I'd like to briefly um, hear about uh, the, um, what you think about competitive landscape and what is your primary um, target market uh, beyond China? Um, for our first goal, maybe Singapore or Thailand, mm -hmm. because, um, for example, if we choose India, there's there are so many kinds groups of people, so it's hard to kind of position like directly of where. But for ex for example, in Singapore, we think people are kind of like an average in the average level, so it's yeah, it's easier for our to open the first. Um, Cross. Yeah, yeah, Asian market. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And the next team is who's good, I think. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Maxim. I'm from who's good. Uh, I kept having like connection problems, so sorry for that. Um, and I didn't know that we need to share the slides before, like prior to the pitch. So uh, I'll just make a make a, a verbal version, okay? Okay. Um, so uh, who's good? Analyzes pu publicly available data sources using AI, and we extract environmental, social, and governance data of publicly listed companies. So this is also known as ESG data. Our clients are asset managers and financial platforms that provide services, financial services to, to the uh, institutional investors. So asset managers can integrate ESG data to make, for example, make an ESG fund, like let's say ESG ETF, whereas financial platforms can integrate ESG data into their platforms to create a new content for their clients. We currently have two main business models. The first one is the content providing business model where we charge fees for customization of the data and the data feed. The second business model is the platform sus subscription. We have our own platform and we charge annual subscription fees to uh, asset managers. So currently, we have two challenges that we are trying to overcome. The first one is developing a new market in Korea. ESG service providers in Korea are operating as consulting firms. They manually collect the data uh, using part-timers, and then they provide uh, annually updated scores, consulting, and report services to asset managers and they charge from 40 and up to $100,000 per customer. What Who's Good is trying to do, we are trying to move from the consulting business to the data business by leveraging AI technologies. We want to provide up-to-date ESG insights and tools to the clients at a reasonable price so they can make a socially responsible investment decisions. And for this reason, we set three go we set two goals uh, for Q4. The first one was to integrate, in order to make this data business available, we, we were trying to integrate ESG content and ESG data into any possible financial product. So the first one, we integrated, um, ESG data into the fund evaluation report. So we partner up with the Korea fund ratings and the report will be available next month. The second one, we partner up with the Bell, which is financial service provider. 
And we together, we crafted and launched an ESG tracker service for their clients. And the third one, we, we've partnered with NH Security and Uri Asset Management. And next month, we will launch two ESG indexes and one ESG ETF based on our data. So as you can see, we don't really have, because it's B2B business and we don't really have like these kind of KPIs, but we just set the goals and we were uh, trying to find the niche market, the small market and dominate in there. The second one, um, the, the second goal that we set is to launch our own platform, make an MVP based on the customer needs and have at least one paying customer. And actually two days ago, we signed a contract uh, with uh, VI Asset Management and they will become our first uh, platform user. Uh, this is all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, it was on time too. <laughs> Yeah, and it was very clear, you know, without any slides, so uh, you don't have to worry about it. And the teams without slide, uh, also, you know, uh, we didn't we didn't actually uh, make a slide as a mandatory. Um, so you can just formally um, introduce your core business and give us the um, KPIs and the challenges. Um, Tangsong or um, TK and other partners, do you guys have any um, questions related to the? Uh, uh, I have a short. Oh, okay, TK, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I have short short question just for understanding. Uh, can you briefly share your current tractions and your target market? Yeah, so the target market is asset management companies and financial platforms in Korea. And currently we have, for this year, we have $200,000 of revenue, but because of the coronavirus, we couldn't make it, like as much sales as we did last year. So last year it was $600,000. So your annual revenue last year was $600,000? Yes, correct. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. Is the six hundred thousand dollar means uh, kind of uh, the fee revenue or the full transaction? Uh, the content providing the, the the fee that we charge for the data fee. Okay, that's massive. Mm. All right. Um, no other uh, further questions? I, I have a lot of questions, but um, for yeah. timing purposes. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we can set another another call with the team. So uh, let's move on to the next team, Empo. The Empo team just came in. Uh, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Empo is a um, trading app for mobile data. And we are targeting uh, Bangalore, India. And the reason we targeted India was because we had an initial influx of users from India without any marketing. Mm -hmm. So the keywords of hotspot uh, data sharing and mobile data uh, for affordable price, um, that worked in 2018 and 2019. Mm -hmm. So we kept focusing on how to localize the app for the users in India. And then we had a seed investment from Bon Angels. And um, this year, February, I actually visited the, the, the city to see and to incorporate the company there. And, and in end of February, and then that's when I left the, the India and the COVID hit. Um, so our major challenge was to make people get uh, use our app. And our app is basically need two people in at least uh, in 50 meter proximity. Um, the concept of sharing data is done by sharing mobile data uh, hotspot tethering. So you need to gather within the uh, 10 to 50 meter range. The problem was that because of the COVID, our previous marketing didn't work because they couldn't go out 
um, out, outside their home house. Um, and we, we did perform a uh, marketing research um, through the local agency. And then their recommendation is to hold all, all, all our plans for, uh, for longer period than we, we expected because 70% of the internet users are stuck at home instead of going outside. Uh, we, are tar- we are targeting uh, like little shrines, um, the Hindu, Hindu temples around the Bengal. That's where I saw many people gather just standing there doing nothing, maybe talking to one another. Um, you know, I was trying to create little community, community app or community service that, and that they can share their internet and that they, they do activities online there. Um, so that was our challenge. Our goal was to gather uh, at least 100 MAU in one square kilometer. Um, that's a pretty large area. So 100 number, uh, that might be, then might not be really optimal number, but that was our initial goal um, during the COVID. And then, you know, as I tried, you know, it turned out that it's very difficult while people are locked down, uh, locked in their house. Um, but for Q4, I aim to still achieve 50 people uh, since I know that people in India, they start to just coming out of home despite the situation now. Um, so um, always the M- gathering the MAU, the fixed number of MAU and retention rate is our probably the only goal. Um, and I'm trying to uh, prove that you know that's the uh, right approach to you know um, revive the uh, app service that had before in in late 2019. Thank you. Probably COVID-19 is kind of like, a, you know, one of the biggest challenges for all the teams. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, so the fact is the, the fact that it prevents uh, people to go out and gather. And I'm trying to think how, you know, still, still despite that, how to make, you know, people to gather around, you know, but the thing is that within your family, they don't trade your mobile data when you're home. So, so how, how then, I know that the at home internet, for home internet in Bangalore, it's not unlimited. You get like 300 gigabytes per month or per quarter. Then their, their demands say, oh, maybe I should trade the home internet with other neighbors. Um, but, you know, in order to do that, I need to be a telecom or MVNO at least. Yeah. Um, so we're trying. We've tr- we've done any POC in Korea too, and then you know, we realized the market and the industry is also locked up by the, all the telecom powers and mm-hmm. their monopolies. Um, do you also have any other market options? Um, India. Yes. Um, so the UK was our next, not possible target, but the, we we wanted to see how they respond to. Um, the idea, uh, while the, the UK would be probably in the medium, medium um, range for pri- pricing for mobile data. Um, yeah, the time is up. I know Korea wouldn't work because the reward is not good enough for Koreans. But many POC uh, ideas says it might work because I see the, uh, the line number nine in Seoul Metro they, they have this advertise that, you know, that you can make some small money out of doing this, like the Uber-like or Pedari uh, Minjok-like services. All right. Um, any other further questions for... Um... Uh, I'll ask questions uh, later. Yeah, so many right. questions. Um, technical, um, you know, technical questions and uh, how, how it works and uh, yeah, et cetera. Okay. All right, then we'll um, keep on the track. Um, next up is iTruck. Hi. Hi. Hi, can you see me? Yep. Sure. 
Um, hi everyone. Um, I'm the founder of iTrog. Um, it's very nice meeting you guys here. Um, first, please let me explain about the core business of iTrog. Um, iTrog is a platform for used truck sales where truck sellers and buyers can um, interact each other with our real-time live sessions. Um, in order to start work, truckers need two things. Uh, first one is the truck and second one is the license number plate. So this is required by the Korean law um, under the Trucking Transportation Business Act. So uh, we'll have a matching system where we match the trucks to the license plates. Um, iTruck will also provide job search and reliable logistics information and truckers to sell their own trucks through the bidding system on our platform. So this will be a one-stop service platform for uh, truckers. And lastly, uh, we'll also provide and forecast um, consumer preferences, uh, use truck price patterns, uh, license plate price fluctuations, and logistic cycles based on the data analysis. Uh, moving on to uh, challenges. Um, our first challenge, like any other startups, uh, is working capital. So obviously we need the budget to hire quality people and maintain the business. Uh, another challenge uh, I faced recently is to hire salespeople. Uh, we need the right people to uh, promote our business to dealers and truckers. And finding the right people for a startup is a difficult process. So uh, the sales team needs to be, you know, very proactive, uh, fully understand the business so that they can explain the old um, fashioned way of doing things to change the industry closer to digitalization and also attract dealers uh, at the same time. Uh, moving on to uh, 2020 milestone. So our target for quarter four this year is to um, uh, launch our platform. So our phase one will include uh, first buying my truck, um, second matching the number plates to the truck, and lastly creating the iTruck magazine um, in order to increase traffic and retention rate which will be a, a space for creating a sense of belonging and involvement with our truckers. Uh, we also um, target to uh, launch our platform by January 2021. So until then, we'll certify at least uh, 20 dealers to join our platform to upload used truck sales. So until December this year, we'll recruit and select our uh, existing network of dealers, truckers and transportation companies to start the beta testing so that their feedback will be reflected on our launching version accordingly. So lastly, our success indicators uh, are completing the task mentioned in phase one. And also to launch iTruck, we need at least uh, 20 certified dealers to upload their sales so that um, it can be an attractive factor for truckers to join our pl platform. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, as far as I know, uh, there's n there's no direct competitor, uh, at least in uh, Korea. So, yes. what do you think is the reason? Um, is the industry um, not um, regarded as profitable enough, or uh, what do you think? Um, well, as you mentioned, we are the first mover for this uh, truck trade, uh, trucks traded um, platform business. But in regards to the market size, I don't think it is a small market because there is about um, there is sorry about that. There is about three point six million trucks um, in uh, registered in Korea at the moment. And if you look at the ratio for used trucks versus the new trucks, it's about 45 to uh, 55 uh, ratio. So if you look at the uh, used truck market, it's about 100, uh, 1.7 million trucks um, uh, overall as for the market size. And if I uh, priced out the price for each truck, it's about 40, uh, 43,000 uh, USD. So if I multiply the 1.7 million 
uh, used trucks by the 43,000 USD. It's about 72 tri uh, trillion USD market size. So I don't think it is a small market. So I'm, uh, I'm confident that, you know, we have this uh, opportunity in this trucking industry. Great. Uh, sounds like a blue ocean if it works. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, there's uh, many successful uh, used car dealer or platform services so far, you know. Uh, but the Ventures has a, uh, one experience. We invested in one, one of them. Uh, I think uh, the existing big uh, used car platform uh, can try to extend their market to used uh, truck, you know. And mm -hmm. how do you... Uh, uh, what what do you think about your strategy to yeah, protect from the competitors? Um, so I guess the industry of the uh, used car versus the used trucks is a very different industry. Um, mm -hmm. If you look at the users, um, their characteristics of users and the characteristics of the dealers and how they work together is also very different. So that was the reason why the, the you know, for example, a uh, hay dealer or mm -hmm. NCAR, they are very, it's, it's very difficult. They are struggling to enter into the trucking industry because the market itself is a closed market. So, you know, at least we have the network from our headquarter. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to have that fundamentals first uh, with the network. And with that, we are trying to increase our market size, for example, from the 5% um, five percent that we are having at the moment to the 30% market share. And the, also okay. the, you know, the relationships of the, the, um, the dealers and uh, and the the users, it's very also the the structure is also very different too. So it it will be very difficult for for example NCAR to enter into this trucking industry. Okay. All right. Um, no further questions, I guess. Yep. Thank you very much, Aitra. Thank and you. <laughs> We're going to move on to Mush Labs, if they're here. Okay. Seems like um, they're not yet here. So um, I'm gonna ask one, one more question for iTruck. So uh, it seems like you are actually uh, handling the licensed vehicle uh, market. So um, is there any like challenges or risk that you can expect from the regulation or from, you know, some other uh, government related threats or something like that? Hannah, are you? Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, were you asking? Sorry, could okay. you repeat that question for me? Yeah, so I, <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> I thought, um, yeah, it's, um, you, you're in the licensed vehicle industry, so it's a little bit different from other, like, you know, retail vehicles, like a uh, small size of the uh, automobiles. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any kind of a specific uh, uh, regulation related risks or challenges that you're facing or you can expect? Um, for example, our headquarter has, uh, you know, the license issues uh, for the number plate. Um, but for the iTruck platform itself, um, I don't think there will be any regulation issues related to that because um, we'll uh, use our headquarters license if necessary at, at a further stage, not at the moment because we are just trading the used uh, truck the moment but if we go into the number plates market yes as you mentioned uh, this is a, a, a industry where we need the, definitely need the license but our headquarter has a, 
uh, seven licenses in total, so we can um, use one of the headquarters licenses uh, in that case. Okay, thank you. Um, still, we are waiting for much, much wraps, right? Yeah, so it looks like the startups are changing their slots to make it like uh, later. So okay, maybe they need more time for preparation. Is there uh, is there any team who who I know your time slots are are down below, but if anyone is ready, um, we could probably give you more time. Uh, so let us know. Any show of hands? Yeah. This is Archer from GivePack. Can I pitch right before my schedule? Okay, sure. so GivePack, you are going to be given a little bit more time than the others. Thank you. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. I, guess I just realized that yeah, all the meetings keep packing here. Yeah, so, okay. Can I, let me share my screen real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, I know it's like um, the pitch direction is a little different compared to like um, what we usually do with investors, yeah. So, um, yeah. Let me. Sh can you guys see my slide already? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Okay. Let's. Maybe. All right. Yeah. Um. Hello, everyone. My name is Archer. Good evening. And I'm currently calling from Seoul in Korea, and we are an AI-powered business gifting platform. So typically, we um what we do in one line is we send perfectly match gifts like on um, to grow business. Uh, we make personalization as skill with technology. And so on um, the very straight to the pro the problems that we're solving. Um, around three years ago, a lot of um, business um, clients keep knocking my door and say, hey Archer, can you tell um, can you help me to handpick or personalize the gifts for my clients and employees? I say, sure, definitely. And what am I we looking at? And so five thousand per month. I say five thousand? Um, so we can uh, like do it manually. And then on they have also follow up questions about, hey, on um, how um, have you ever tried to track your return of investment of your gifts? And somehow like um, no matter in which country we're going for the business meetings, we just feel like, hey, we we carry a gifts to them on to um, our business partner's office. And I just feel like I got more successful way to close the deal. Yeah, but have you ever think about um, what are the quantified numbers of that? So, and these questions um, keep like knocking on, um, like um, just um, make me brainstorming a lot of solutions. And we want to make this personal relation stuff be able to stay with, with technology. The idea generation, logistics, packaging, shipping, tracking, all of stuff is so time times consuming. And clients should put more of their, I mean, most of their time to somebody else to grow their business, getting the deals done instead of sending gifts. So, um, because COVID-19 actually uh, uh, is kind of a booster for our business and how can I actually deliver all the gifts to different countries? Even Pinterest, they give us 90 million uh, like US dollar for their headquarters. So right now, all, all of their employees are not gonna work in Silicon Valley anymore. They are somewhere else. Yeah. So um, it used to be an easy job to order all the gifts to my office and then distribute it like um, just um, within a few minutes. And now, different countries, different places. How can this happen? So gift pack. And what we provide is an only one solution for gifting on business. We help business to pick and send perfect match gifts to strengthen your professional relationship with one click. Right? On first one, on we have an AI technology to help you do the gift picking. And based on your receiver's preferences, personalities, and we find out the great items on the top five from more than 2 million great stuff around the world from nine different countries. And then also we do outreach at scale. You can treat it as a sales tool and no matter it's for like on uh, the code reach or also like you are sending gifts to other, other employees, no matter it's 500 or 10,000 and we can calculate simultaneous at the same time. And then we also do the packaging and all these logistics um, afterwards all in one. And then the most important part is about the integration. So on um, for the larger corporations, they use Salesforce, Hotspot, as their CRM systems. And then and currently in recent days, we use Slack. And it's very hard for the um, bigger like companies to spend some time educate their employer, salespeople, HR people to learn but not apply from code gift pack. So it will be very easy for them to hey, simply add a widget, add a plugin, um, add an app on Slack, 
right now, simply type slash gift pack and to Jimmy. Yeah. So um, people can, so our program can retrieve all the data about Jimmy and then start calculating all the options. And it's gonna talk to you with the chat bot directly inside of Slack. You don't even need to know about gift packs platform and then you can get a gifts and this, you don't need to care about the sourcing, packaging, a lot of stuff and hold on by us. Yeah, just with one click. Uh, so on um, how does that count so far? Um, so um, based on uh, more than 10,000 gifts that we already sent out to our clients worldwide and every gifts that we saved them for 6.5 hours, which means if you want to send 100 and we, we help you to save 650. Very straight. And then we also have a really good like um, review system. So um, currently 86% satisfaction rate about our gift picking and also the entire service. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure like the purpose of this pitch is about the challenges that we're facing and also our KPIs for Q4. And then so currently on our entire service and algorithms, like we need time and traffic to collect the data and feedback and make the system more accurate. Yeah. So um, right now we are trying to do, um, even we're selling to B2B, and eventually it's like B2B to C. So uh, we are creating a lot more campaigns to be able to like um, share all these ideas and with um, questionnaires. So um, with a lot of individuals can actually hop in to give us feedback and then um, this like, um, I mean, have more interactions. So at the same time, we can get more data and then also we can expand our sales channel and I will explain like more details in the following slide. And the second challenge that we're facing is the B2B sales cycle is too long to give the growth rate. And currently our current MRR is on like 44,000 US dollar per month. And right now for this month, pretty close to 60,000. And uh, this profit is not GMV. Yeah, so uh, we're now like bragging GMV. And then so, but um, it's very hard to, I would say, um, catch up with the growth if uh, we only do the outreach or um, the, the content marketing stuff that takes time. And then also we need, we know a lot, a lot of time to making connections to get big guys on board. And then so we decided to change a bit of our strategy. So uh, make pretty much 90% of our features on, I mean, on, with automation. Uh, so people can simply sign up to, to our platform without any contract. And we're looking at the hotspot, things like that. Yeah, so on the, like the short, I mean, the small amount, but like more frequent revenue keep coming in, like um, in a start from um, two weeks ago. And so um, because it's a really big season for corporate gifting from September to like um, last January. We don't want to lose track, like um, just keep talking to people with um, by ourselves. And there's a lot of things that we can be done to shorten the sales cycle. And then the, the third part that we learned a lot um, is platform integration are more important than our web location for corporations. Um, in this ap on April, um, we actually lost two 200,000 US dollar deal just because we don't have integration with Salesforce. You know, so and like we were so close that like we were about to sign a contract and our client just um, pop up a random question. Hey, you guys definitely have an integration with Salesforce, right? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't. Yeah, so like 400,000 deal, it's just gone. Yeah, and then so we're looking at, and from that we learned a lot, like uh, we should have open APIs and also um, the, we prioritize our schedule I mean, product development schedule, not, not super focused on our own platform, but on the integration. So people don't need to jump out of their, like on what they're doing at the moment and to learn something new, just like inside of the platform should be also like, good as well. And then, so what are our Q4 KPIs? Um, first of all, of course, sales, um, like uh, we're still early stage. Yeah, so uh, the 100,000 K uh, MR, of course, and we're pretty much like 60% uh, down. And then with the shillings and on um, more than 5,000 like, uh, shillings will be generated. And then for integrations, uh, which is pretty much halfway down. Yeah, we got like three months left. Yeah, but so far we're super positive on that number. And fortunately, in the past three months, all of my financial projections were wrong. Yeah, so we are pretty much three times and five times more than I thought. Yeah, so which is good. And then even like um, even today, um, we pretty much closed two deals in this in the state like this morning. Yeah, so I'm um, still very positive on that. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. And then I think um, I'm pretty much okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Again, take a look at the chat too. 
Thank you. And any um, further questions relating to the KPIs or challenges? Okay. Um, I think this is a good sign because, you know, it was very uh, explicitly um, elaborated from your slide and your explanation. So um, let's go on to most reps. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I think we are missing much reps today. Um, why don't we move on to uh, rehab with us if they're ready? Are we? Hi. 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 Hello. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Yes. Is it working? Yeah. Maybe the cutting is the problem. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I think you have some connection problem. Uh, Team Damogo, are you guys ready for the pitch? Yep. Okay, then why don't we switch the two teams? Because I, I, yeah, I think we have has some, a little bit of a connection issue. So, yep. Damogo. Okay. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hello. <laughs> yeah, we can you hear us. Yeah, we can we can hear you now. So, well, what I suppose, but what I suggest to you. Still, some question is problem. We, yeah, because I, I think we have some kind of like issues with your connection because there's some sound yes. delays. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, uh, we're going to give you five more times so of switching the team order uh, with the, the okay. next team, Tamogo. So you can figure out. And then uh, okay. back once again, all right? All right. Okay, uh, thank you. Welcome, Lean. Uh, okay. If you're ready, then you can just go on. Okay, I'll share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, you know, if, if you've ever, I mean, you've been to restaurants, bakeries, and grocery stores, and at the end of the day, uh, I'm sure you've noticed that there's still untouched food on the shelves or at the restaurants that has not been sold and untouched. Um, unfortunately, this food most of the time gets thrown away and it goes it goes to waste. So it's it's not just restaurants, bakeries, and grocery stores, but actually in Indonesia where we're operating, it's also from farms. So 30 to 40 percent of every uh, uh, agricultural harvest is it goes to waste because either uh, the small scale farmers can't sell it all or uh, there's ugly or imperfect or weird looking fruit and vegetables that are of much lower grade uh, and uh, you know, distributors don't want to buy it and big chains, supermarkets don't want to buy it. So this is a huge problem on both levels of, of the food industry. And it happens everywhere else in the food industry, unfortunately. So what we did was we created a all-in-one app um, to allow any venue that sells food to sell food on our app at a discount. So basically, if we're, if we're talking about restaurants and bakeries and grocery stores, we partner with them and instead of throwing away uh, the croissants at the end of the day, they can upload it to our app at a discount. Anybody can, can see it and buy it. This is all same day food that's untouched. So our farms um, as well, we work with the farms that we help them sell their unsold or, or their uh, ugly, imperfect food and vegetables on our app. People can order it and they can choose any pickup points near them where they can pick it up the next morning. Um, and then, uh, we also uh, supply this farm produce to our uh, to our uh, business partners as well, which I'll explain in a second, which is here. Um, so our, our business model, we have three working business models right now. The first one is if any if any user purchases food from our restaurant partners, we keep 20% of everything. 
for our imperfect fruit and vegetables that uh, we sell, we help the farm sell on our app through pickup points. We put between a 20 to a 30, for 30 to 40 percent margin on that. For the farm imperfect produce that we supply our restaurant partners, we put a 20 to 40 percent margin. Um, so we have three working ones, and we'll soon have a P2P model where we'll allow any user to share untouched food from their home with their neighbors. And uh, this is we have plans to monetize this later, but it's more of a user acquisition tool for us in the beginning. So our, our, our KPIs, the KPIs that we look after are, is um, user stickiness, DAU divided by MAU, um, our partner sell rate percentage. So how many, how much percent of whatever they upload is actually getting sold? Our target is 60%. We would like to get 60% of everything our partners sell to be sold. Uh, the number of orders per day and the average value of that order. And also, of course, our net take. Um, challenges we have right now is balancing users and partner activation. We have more than 3,000 com committed restaurant partners uh, for, the, for the BTC side. However, we have not activated all of them because we don't have the user base yet. So we have about 6,000 total registered users. So we need to balance that, you know, get that user acquisition, then, then activate more stores. And that's kind of a tough part for us. Another thing is scaling operations uh, without me and myself being on the ground. My co-founder is from Indonesia. He's there on the ground. Uh, he, he, we're doing this distribution of fruit and vegetables ourselves, and I have a background in that. And for me to not be able to travel there and, and help out, it really kills me. Uh, although my, my co-founder is doing a really good job. Uh, to measure our KPIs, uh, we, uh, we have a data, well, data scientist engineer intern that's been um, building a, a dashboard for us. So we're able to track, it's being built right now and it's almost done. So we'll soon be able to track our KPIs through our dashboard. And this is a screenshot of one of, um, one of the things on our dashboard. Um, that's pretty much it. And uh, uh, we just uh, launched two months ago and our B2B is really starting to grow now. We just signed a major deal with uh, a restaurant that has 13,000 13, outlets. And we're about to start pilot testing with them on our B2C side as well as start distributing at least four to five tons of imperfect produce every single day, uh, starting in next week or in two weeks. And uh, I'll take any questions here. So partners, if you have any questions related to Tamago, please um, go on. Uh, so, uh, do you have any uh, priority in terms of uh, your target um, geography? I mean, um, not geography, target um, village or target um, district. Yeah. So right now, uh, we're we started in Yogyakarta, where we're based out of, and our team's based out of there. So our B two C is all there. Uh, we're actually starting to activate stores in Jakarta next week or in two weeks. Um, and so, and also at the same time, as we activate those stores in Jakarta, we'll also be supplying the restaurants in Jakarta. Uh, well, one of our restaurant partners, the big restaurant partners that we'll be start supplying next week. So in, uh, you'll get Jakarta first, then Jakarta, and then likely after that, Bali. Yeah, I know. Um, but Jakarta is a, a big city, you know, so... I think um, you need to um, uh, solve the chicken and egg problem. So maybe uh, you have priority a smaller district, uh, uh, targeting smaller district first and yeah. Oh, in Jakarta. Mm -hmm. You mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the operational part, um, cause I don't know, I don't know the, I don't know Jakarta very well. Uh, my co-founder, he, he's managing all the operations and managing starting from one area to go to another. That's what we did in Yogi Kart as well. We started in uh, one major neighborhood and we start, we started to expand from there. Okay, uh, got it, yeah. Thank you, I think it's time's up. Yeah, we are a little bit tight for the schedule right now. So um, uh, no more changes, please. And um, what we have with us, are you guys are ready? Yes, yes, we are ready. <laughs> so thanks for waiting us. So right. is it, does it work? Yeah. You wait, hear us? Yeah. Okay, we uh, prepared the uh, slide, but um, 
Well, let me introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm the co-founder and CSO of the uh, RIA with us, and we are now uh, participating in this meeting. So uh, let me show, I uh, share the slide. And let me introduce myself too. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I am a founder and CEO of Rehab with us, and my name is Hyunji Yu, and nice to meet you guys. And uh, oh. we can show you the slide, but the slide is uh, in Korean. I'm sorry about oh, that. Okay. Totally okay. Sorry, we expected the Korean are participating. <laughs> Next time we prepare a uh, very appropriate material. Okay, so, um, I'll look, uh, um, first, first of all, I, I want to uh, briefly explain the service model and then discuss our performance and KPI. Um, with increase of the elderly, the number of stroke patients has drastically skyrocketed in Korea. Although this language disorder is a decisive factor of quality of life, neurological language disorder therapy can be uh, provided by hospital only in very limited period. Accordingly, uh, short service supply in therapy is getting worse. Um, in this re regard, uh, re uh, we are prepared um, the new service in Korea. Uh, Reaper is a service platform that provides speech and language therapies by screening, verifications, matchings, and coachings, and the management service we provide. The main, okay, the main source of revenue for our company is the supervision of treatment costs and additional inspections fees are being uh, received. Uh, patients received treatment for the uh, average of 3 to 12 months. The treatment cost is around uh, 80,000 won per day. And the emo emotional level is uh, 40 to 50% 50, 50 depending on the therapist uh, experience. Since the start of the service, uh, profit are steadily rising, although uh, growth potentials has declined due to the a recent uh, COVID, as you know, the company's awareness and patient satisfactions with the service are increasing and the sales are increasing at an average of 45% uh, by month. Um, so uh, the core success factors of, of our success is that patients use our service a lot and select uh, excellent therapists and educate and coach and increase the service satisfactions. From this point of view, uh, the average number of the patients treated for months is currently at 25 and the uh, 50 therapists. In addition, efforts are being made to improve the quality of service through the continuous satisfaction survey for patients and their cares. Along with the uh, improvement of the service, uh, we are currently uh, planning the applications that allow patients to self-train even without therapists and is scheduled to launch the next year. Uh, there is a similar case in US, which is benchmarked and applied appropriately in Korea. Uh, if this service uh, properly uh, launched and the settled in the markets, uh, uh, a significant increase in sales is expected. So we will focus our capability and energies on this development uh, of this service. So uh, this is a uh, material we prepare and is there any uh, questions we will uh, respond to? Thank you. So I have a two questions. So uh, I'm looking at your slide. And um, so your assumption is that uh, if your user, the number of users is 20,000 in 2026, your, um, your revenue will be like um, uh, 24, million, $24 million. So, um, 
that means um, how much? Uh, so it, it, the assumption is that um, the customers, your customers, will pay um, one hundred U.S. dollar per month. Is it correct? Yes, uh, we benchmarking the uh, service uh, in the U.S. is uh, U.S. applications. So we think that uh, this prices is appropriate. Right, we think, and if we develop more uh, services, we can raise our prices. So uh, comparing the service, as I as I said, that uh, eighty per eighty thousand one per. Uh, one 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 sessions uh, is is very very cheap for the patients. So so we can expand our span of the uh, span of coverage of customers. So uh, in this okay. regard, uh, that is very reasonable prices. We think. I understand. <laughs> and um, so sorry for my ignorance of the industry, but. Um, um, the 20,000 20, uh, users, um, is the market uh, that big? I mean, uh, the, the, the number of people in uh, language uh, treatment? Um, because uh, the stroke patients is getting uh, bigger and bigger customers and mm. uh, Parkinson's or dementia patients also need a speech and language therapy. So uh, we regard the 50% uh, of the stroke patients has to be take a speech therapy and uh, most of, of them want to use uh, this kind of apps applications. So we calculate the number Okay. okay. So, got it. Yeah. <laughs> so, any questions? I think no further questions at this point. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to the next team. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Um, so the next team will be Bosch Reps. Well, I don't think we have Bosch Reps today. So why don't we go to a Dash company? Uh, hello. Can you speak a little bit more closer to your mic, please? Okay. Hello. Thank you. Oh. I think oh. Yeah. So, uh, can you see my? Oh. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Pyeong Yun, um, Dash Company. Uh, today, I'm going to show our service, the sharing package and mirror sharing service. I tried to share my screen, but I don't know how to do. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, on the bottom, you can, yeah. you can see the green button. Yeah. And click the really yeah. Is it? Working? Yep. It's okay. working. Yeah, this is our platform. We are sharing platform with a very sharing service. Uh, actually, we are, we create a solution to settle micro mobility sharing services and use for city mobility. I'm uh, sorry, Bogyeong, but you uh can can you come more, like come closer to the mic? Okay. Can you is it okay? No? Oh, I think like, oh, sorry. Oh, now it, the sound is clear. Okay. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, hello, my name is Bogang of Dash Company. Today I will show you our sharing platform for mobility sharing service. Yeah, this is our concept of the platform. Uh, actually, we create a solution to set up micro mobility sharing service as a new smart, smart city mobility. Um, therefore, we are trying to create a sharing platform with Dash Station. This is our Dash Station uh, to cover all type of electric uh, all type of micro mobility. Um, it builds a mobility ecosystem where we can coexist with coexist with users, people who don't use it, and everyone involved. Um, Dash solution composed component. Uh, yeah, Dash solution component. Uh, uh, yeah, this is our solution. It's a charging station to charge all type of electric electron or micro mobility with our PSU technology and and uh, um the uh yeah and service users can park in the station. The dock, this one is a docking uh, and also uh the the electric scooter can can be docked, so this docking station rationalizes charging and relocation costs, mitigates social costs and impacts, and also serves as a gateway to attract customers to our Dash platform. Um, since Dash platform is open to any PM sharing service providers and individuals, it enable, in, enables true sharing um, of assets and increases the utilization rate of electric scooters. Our Dash system is an integral part of our solution, as customers and like businesses and governments can now uh, enforce policies based on location, time, and experience. There is uh, also functionality to integrate payment system with public transportation, making transport time yet easy. Uh, our biggest challenge is, um, and next up, oh, uh, yeah. Um, actually, our uh, our basic biggest challenge is that to find out a sharing service company and integrate all type of electric scooter protocol um, and sustainable government support. Um, our KPI and goal for uh, KPI KPI and goal. Uh, we've already uh, trailed our solution with the shared offices in Korea. So, and also the winner of, we are the winner of Seoul Smart City in 2019. And uh, we recently uh, generated the first revenue on May 2020. So uh, we are going to launch a service in uh, by July 2021. And we are going, uh, we are going to yeah, and um, we want to become the first global provider of a station and solution in December 2022. Uh, and then, oh, sorry. Yeah, we, op mm, we are, how you make K major KPI and goal? Um, initially, we will be in touch with the local government and businesses to provide a tanky solution of station system and school to deploy the infrastructure. So uh, we are, um, as, as part, time passes by, we will be using those infrastructure to attract other sharing service providers and individuals, owners to use Dash platform generating subscription revenue. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Right. Um, any questions for Dash? Um, I have. I have a question. Yes. Uh, are you preparing your service or uh, already launched your service? Right. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Um, are you? Uh, are you? Uh, did you launch your service at the moment? Yeah, we launched okay. actually beta service in Maguk in Seoul, and we are going to launch um, our service in Hangdong in this year. So you have your own vehicles, and you can take the another another brands. 
another vehicle from the, on other players, right? Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, might be now, but uh, our true purpose is to integrate all the um, sharing service providers. Did I make myself clear? So first time we we service our own electric scooter, but as time passes by, um, mm -hmm. we are going to open to open to any PM service providers, so they can okay. they can use our platform and they can they 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 are going to um, pay platform fee. My last question is uh, how how can you uh, how can you take the spaces? On the road. Ah, yeah, it's a very good question. Actually, in Seoul, uh, we are we are do our businesses with SHG Corporation, Seoul Housing Corporation. So with their help, help, so we can find um, the place to build our infrastructure, and and we are. Uh, we, 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 what are these? Oh, um, and other government like, how do you say the district office, Gangdong-gu or Gangseo-gu, yeah, they help us to build and they, yeah, help. yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Yeah, got it, yeah. <laughs> yep. All right, thank you for the presentation. Uh, because we uh, want to stick on the time, we will be moving to Wallet Engine. Are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, it is your floor now. Hello. Uh, wait, let me just, can I share my screen? Yes. Great. Just one second. <clears throat> Okay, just to confirm, can you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, great. So, 안녕하세요, and hello everyone. My name is Pascal. I'm the business development lead for Wallet Engine. And we are basically, uh, we are based in Singapore and we provide embedded finance for digital communities. And by digital communities, I'm basically referring to any app that has users across markets. So this could be, for example, a Zoom or an Instagram. And now all of these apps nowadays, they face all the similar problem. None of them can move money between their users as part of the user experience. Or to put this into an example, if I want to host, let's say, or teach German classes, I'm based in Korea right now, and my users are distributed in Let's say there are users in France and in Italy and people in Singapore that want to take my classes, then it will be a very painful and tedious procedure for me to collect money and especially small amounts of money from them. And now there are channels we could use looking at, for example, PayPal. But again, PayPal is, is consumer driven and it does not provide Zoom the opportunity to be financially uh, connected to their user, to this user base. And also in the end, using PayPal will of course lead to very high costs for the app itself in the end. And this is what we basically want to change. We want to implement white labeled digital wallets as payment infrastructure. So, and to make this term maybe more grappable for you, uh, looking at Zoom again, we basically implement our wallets within Zoom. So basically in the end, Zoom would have their own section that would be called Zoom Pay. And people could then seamlessly transact or uh, send money between the users and also to Zoom. By implementing our services in the end, Zoom would be able, or the app would be able to use our multi-country licensing. So meaning that we are licensed in several countries. Um, we also run the e-money operations. So basically the transactions would be completely run by us. We add or we have several top up and withdrawal channels and also a very efficient core banking system. In the end, we can basically collect um, our services via a single API. We provide bank rate security and we can, that's kind of our guiding sentence, we can transform any app 
into a financial app within 30 days. And this is again, just an example how it could look like. Again, our service is white labeled. So for Zoom, this would probably appear in blue, let's say. And this is just to showcase the, how the money could flow from uh, two wallets that are based in two different countries, let's say from the US to the Philippines. We also provide a digital debit card feature. So basically for people that don't have a bank account, they could, via our wallets, they could simply uh, get a debit card in order to basically uh, also take part in the virtual transaction space. We also implement local payout and top up channels. So for people that don't have bank accounts, let's say, they could basically in the end go to the convenience store and top up their wallet in cash, drastically improving financial inclusion throughout the world. Uh, looking at our roadmap so far, our main KPI, I would say, is our main KPI is uh, active wallets. And as of now, we uh, aim to have 1 million active wallets by the end of 2020. Towards the end of 2024, we aim to reach 100 plus million active wallets throughout the world. Looking at our, uh, on our roadmap so far, we have implemented our core banking system in 2019 and also the corporation. And we plan to uh, launch with our first customer actually this October. Towards the end of this year, we want to leverage several partnerships such as uh, in Europe, Malaysia and Indonesia. And we also uh, recently got an, uh, into K Startup Grand Challenge. So we have several goals for our, uh, for our um, go to market in Korea. We want to get, a bus get the business established, so strategic partnerships and gain additional customers. Looking at our major risks and challenges for Wallet Engine, these are, for example, on the one hand, funding. So right now we can only launch if we get to a certain amount of funding that I want to show also on the next slide. And this we want to mitigate by basically um, talking to new dear investors here in Korea. And another thing is that um, another risk is the licenses. So we need to acquire the necessary licenses. And this can in some countries take more time and some countries can, less, can take less time. But this we can also mitigate by uh, partnering with uh, local companies that have already an e-money license. So this is our funding state as of now. We raised 1.4 million in seed capital dollars and we're looking for an another investment of 1.5 million US dollars. Thank you so much. And I'm open for any questions now. Any questions from, <clears throat> from the ventures? If not, we will uh, move straight to uh, the next pitch. Teachers Lead Tech. I think I All saw right. you here. Hey. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Stop sharing. Okay. Monica, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I'm just uh, lost my Zoom thing. Here we go. I have issues with um, with sharing my Zoom file. Do you want to send over your file to me, and I can open it for you? Uh, while sure, the fantastic. Okay. Um, In that case, why don't we have? Uh, the next team. Thank you, Jimin. Are you guys here? Yeah. Edumi? Yes, I am here. Give me one second. I'm gonna, you want me to share my screen? Uh, give me a second as well. Your screen. 
Uh, where is this thing? Here. Uh, one second. So, okay, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Second, <laughs> the computer is not working, sorry. Uh, okay, so today uh, I want to share with you, I'm gonna actually show you my face as well. Uh, oh my God, where is this thing? I, what I can, here. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so today I want to share with you how we, ha how we got hundreds of thousands of features using our product. Uh, yes, hundreds of thousands. Hi everyone, I am Leo, founder and CEO of Evumi, a company that I started a few years ago with a very simple mission, to help out just one person. Meet Mariela, my favorite school teacher. Uh, through the years, I saw Maria struggling with the amount of paperwork she had to do inside and outside the classroom, working sometimes 80 hours a week. And just like her, there are tens of millions of other teachers trying to get their time back by using technology. But this has been difficult for them, mainly because uh, most of the tools they need are fragmented into different apps and websites or are too difficult to set up. To solve this, we built Edumi, which is the most friendly and secure way for teachers to save time and to connect with their students, to communicate, collaborate and share. You can think of the intersection between Facebook and Slack, but for the classroom. Teachers can easily continue conversations with the entire class outside the classroom. They can share resources with their students. They can mark tests, craft lesson plans, build quizzes and assign homework, among other things. We've been working really hard to master this problem, integrating all the tools that teachers and students need in just one place. And we already are helping quite a bunch of them. Not 100, not 200,000. In fact, we already have more than 600,000 registered users using Edumi coming from all over the world. And we are spending this much on marketing, zero dollars. Uh, we've been able to double our user base um, for every year for the last three years only by word of mouth. And here's another fact, uh -huh, sorry. Uh, Edumi is helping teachers save up to seven hours a week and is helping their students increase their outcomes with their learning outcomes by 30% each year. Just so you can get a better understanding of our growth, here is a graph of uh, Slack's early growth with funding and hours just, just by bootstrapping our company. Until now, we have run some experiments uh, using different revenue models. Uh, we started selling to the government uh, a few years ago, we've been able to generate 250,000 US dollars in revenue, uh, but late last year, we changed our model to a B2C model, allowing teachers to register by themselves uh, using a freemium model. So teachers can go to Adumi, register for free with limited access to our tools. And if they want to unlock all of the tools, they can jump to the team version, which is priced per teacher per month. And if schools or principals want school level access to statistics or students progress, they can jump to the school version, which is in development right now. Um, so the reason why, because why we change model is because change, working directly with the government is incredibly difficult. So we realized that we quickly realized that uh, working with the government is not scalable. So that's why we moved to a B2C model. So to back this model, this are, there's a huge market and a huge opportunity. There's a global, the global spending on software for education is more than uh, 180 US, uh, billion US dollars every year. And we are going after a big piece of this cake. So a lot of people think of going global, but we were born as a global company. Uh, we started helping out just Mariela and some of her fellow teachers with a small but passionate team of just three people. Vive, who's one of my best friends uh, with nine years of experience in marketing. Sebastian, who's one of my brothers also with nine years of experience building software, and myself with 14 years of experience building software as well. But for our next steps, we need to scale our team. And that's why we are looking for investment. So later we can discuss about uh, the terms of our investment run, which is our biggest challenge right now. 
uh, for the coming year. So we already hit. So just this is this is uh, actually kind of crazy for us because just for the month and a half, for the past month and a half, we grew forty five thousand users. Uh, we're really excited about that. This is uh, mainly because of COVID. And for next year, we plan to launch our mobile app, which we still don't have. And we plan to hit 1 million users. And the year after, we plan to double our user base again. Uh, so basically, what we are looking for now is for investors that understand the value of this curve. So if you are one of them, come talk to us. And the main reason why I'm so passionate about education and about helping out Marilla out and all these million teachers is because Marilla is my mom and she's a school teacher. This is Edumi, thank you. All right, thank you for sharing your motive as well. I think maybe, uh, sh shall we have some questions uh, for Leonardo? If not, then thank you, Leonardo. Monica, you. if you could unmute yourself, I yep. will share the I'm screen here. for you. Do you see it? Thank you. And we can, I'll just say next and uh, we can move from there. And uh, it's amazing and I'm very honored to, to continue after Leonardo because we both work with the same people or the same or the same uh, um, uh, women mainly who are uh, making impact in education every day, even while we're sitting here. So next, please. As we all know, technology is not only creating change, but also new roles requiring new skills and adaptation in the new economy uh, with or without the pandemic. Next, please. And there is a very um, sensitive group of people, uh, 32 million primary school teachers now in the world who are serving more than 700 million kids today. And by 2030, the group will, go will grow from to 35 million teachers and 800 million kids. Next, please. To meet teachers where they are, and to move them to 21st century, we're building a guided learning tool for primary school teachers to bring technology creation skills to every kid in the classroom. Next, please. Based on scientific research and experiments, we see that we need to base on three pillars, building competence, competence with data-driven guided learning path, confidence with regular skill building sessions, cheerleading support in the learning journey for the teacher and with time-saving technology-based content for teachers to involve technology creation in their regular curriculum, like building biology with VR worlds or using creative computing to understand history. Next, please. As for teacher feedback, uh, what they see in changing in their classroom when they use technology creation. Our joyous one is that teachers say that kids of various abilities can experience joy of learning, which impacts them as learners, not only as result achievers. And of course, it's very important to see that kids see technology beyond social networks and play. They discover it is a tool for creative expression when they're eight or seven years old. Next, please. Now we're finalists at MIT uh, Solve Global Challenge. Also have been working with Google to date. Next, please. And with the help of Impact Collective, the community and the support, while also whilst in the Key Startup Grand Challenge in Korea, we're prepping for the pilot with, um, um, to, and we need to accelerate contacts with local authorities, municipalities, and, and schools to reach teachers. We're uh, hoping to launch in uh, Korea together with the new school year in March, and we need to establish connections both with the government and ministries and technology companies as investors and buyers into teacher learning experience and ongoing and for growth 
we are uh, looking for an investment for growth in Asia. We just um, closed a round of uh, 500,000 euros for product building, and we'll be seeking for the next one for growth in Asia. Next, please. Our KPIs are very, very simple. We want to reach as many teachers as possible. So for the pilot, we'll be working with two or 300 teachers with a free open course, just to sample, gather feedback and adjust. And our goal as for impact is to see knowledge transfer, and which means that we, we want at least 80% of teachers to try out the content in the classroom with a result of over 1,500 kids getting a sampling to the skills we're providing. Next, please. And when it comes to scaling, we're, uh, we're willing to work with social investors, municipalities, government, technology companies who will be investing in schools. And uh, by reaching one school, we can reach at least 10 teachers. And if we reach uh, 10,000 schools, by end of 2025, we can reach more than uh, 1.5 million kids or all the kids in primary school uh, schools in Korea. So they are creative technology solving the next world's biggest problems or they're attending. <laughs> Someone muted me? No worries. Next, please. I think we're done. Thank you. That's the last slide, and you're just on time. Um, do we have any questions for Monica? If not, uh, we can uh, move on to jump parking. Are you guys here? Yep. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you really well. Yeah. Uh, uh, share the slide uh, that you yeah, sent me. So, okay. There you go. Okay. So basically, my name is Sam. I'm uh, basically uh, handling for the business department, uh, development and partnership department. So I just going to give a very short and precise uh, slide for it. So uh, next, please. Okay, so basically, John Parking Senior Bahar uh, provides end-to-end -end smart parking uh, solution to parking operators and city council. So basically, for our B2C segment, we provide a mobile application uh, uh, which giving uh, end consumer a hassle-free parking payment experience. And for the B2B segment, uh, basically, in Malaysia, there is 149 city council. So we we provide uh, John Force, which is a in-house uh, enforcement system that enable efficient enforcement um, management through real-time reporting, and the enforcer from the council can uh, validate the parking transaction by scanning. Uh, vehicle plate number and issue violation compound ticket for illegal parking session. Uh, thirdly, we uh, we also provide John Valet, which is a digitalized valet solution uh, for the parking operators who um, major a majority of them relying uh, relying on uh, cash collection, which it gives a uh, transparency in their operation. Uh, to manage their parking competently, which can result to at least 10% uh, reduce in their potential leak of uh, revenue by cash collection. Lastly, we provide a John Agent, which is a digitalized portable e-coupon system with, uh, with the aim to replace the city council traditional parking coupon which allow local council to overview all their transactions in real time, uh, which can reduce their OPEX by at least 20%. Uh, next, please. Okay, so uh, the three biggest challenges in year 2020 uh, with the impact 
collective in uh so oh uh, sorry oh okay uh I, th oh, I think you you got the latest uh, slide okay so uh so the first challenges that we're facing is actually uh is about the pandemic which uh during march uh malaysia all the cities is, uh, has been locked down and we uh, government introduced a conditional movement control order which impact our uh, business operation for more than three months time so during the time we uh, feel like it's very important for us to develop non-parking revenue so during the uh, period we uh, our team actually working with some uh, system development project as well as we are uh, second second challenges that we are facing also do, uh, during the the pandemic we we feel like all uh, our majority of our revenue stream uh, the sales cycle is slightly long and uh, for the street parking and also our some of our overseas project has been postponed due to the pandemic as well so <clears throat> Uh, we are in the process of uh, creating a new SaaS product which uh, can easily acquire new client in short term periods. So, because in Malaysia, most of the uh, uh, parking collection, especially for the smaller size of parking operators, they are still relying, uh, re relying on manual cash collection. So we wish to accelerate the uh, digitization and um, and towards a cashless society. So the the biggest uh, challenges in uh, year 2020 is the uh, team motivation issue whereby uh, due to the pandemic, our the way how we work and also uh, the work, uh, workflow and even the our uh, tasks our, in terms of our workload surprisingly increased a lot. So that's why uh, in terms of the strategy that we're gonna uh, uh, overcome these challenges is that we're gonna have a team building session on next month. Hopefully the pandemics uh, uh, are getting better soon. Next please. Okay, so uh, the most important KPI, sorry, the previous slide please. So uh, the most important slide in uh, year 2020, together with the uh, IC program, will be uh, we wish to raise our Series A fundraising, targeting with a uh, uh, US dollar one to two million, so that we can equip with sufficient fundings to uh, aggressively expand within whole Malaysia, together with few of our uh, overseas expansion projects. Secondly, is that uh, we actually within this 10 week period, we are targeting to launch our new SaaS product and with a uh, targeting with all those cash collection small parking operators, targeting 30 clients uh, with a GTV of uh, 1 million ringgit Malaysia per month. Uh, th uh, thirdly, will be uh, we wish that. Uh, we wish to uh, generate a uh, new non-parking revenue through uh, marketplace such as uh, insurance which we are in the process of uh, uh, getting the so-called the license and also the, the, the uh, examination as well so uh, secondly is that we also aiming to get uh, at least one white label project uh, uh, particularly for overseas uh, project yep that's all thank you sam all right do we have any questions from our uh from the ventures regarding john parking and their services if not then we will move on to Falcon. Hello. Falcon? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So I should share my screen now, yeah? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
Perfect, it works. All right, so uh, is there a timer that's going to appear? I don't see one. Uh, if you can you see my screen at the same time you're sharing one? I can see I can see your face, not your screen. Yeah, yeah. So I I'll hold up my um my my phone. I'm timing the five minute pitch here, so you can start whenever you're ready. Excellent. Okay. So um, I'm Raphael. I run Vulcan Augmetics. We make prosthetics, affordable modular prosthetics for developing nations um that help people regain their physical and financial independence find work and regain their pride uh so in essence the problem um existing prosthetics although it's quite a big market 12.3 billion it is uh not serving 40 million amputees in developing nations so there are 40 million amputees in developing nations 38 million have zero access to care this is because the industry at the moment has, uh, it doesn't meet their needs. Products are high priced um, with the nearest competitor to us being about two and a half times the cost. They are low access, so it's very difficult to get them. You have to go to the clinic. There's not the infrastructure to maintain them. They're high maintenance, so robotic prosthetics especially are hard to take care of. Uh, they require regular maintenance, and if you're in a developing nation, that also uh, means they need to be a bit more robust, otherwise you have to travel back to the clinic a lot. And they're low utility in that they, are very, they can be very wonderful and high tech, but they won't actually help people in developing nations with practical everyday jobs. Um, so our solution is by combining an innovative product with an extended ecosystem. So the product is modular. So the whole thing is designed to separate into individual pieces that the user can replace in less than a minute. So it's all about being user accessible. It means we can mass produce it um, using standard mass manufacturing techniques. So it's more affordable and high quality. Uh, we have an extended ecosystem in terms of um, not just the users that pay directly, but we also go through clinics, we also go through hospitals, uh, medical insurance, and finally we work with corporate partners and CSR programs to get them to fund the uh, starting prosthetic. Also, all of our accessories are designed to be manufactured by fab labs and 3D printers, so it's decentralized uh, accessories. We make the core product, they make the extras. So far, we have the functional robot arms, we have the range of uh, different aesthetics and covers, and we have uh, tools for work and play. So we have one tool here, uh, which actually, if I just show that here, this is designed to help you be a waiter. That was designed with the coffee house in Vietnam. The one below is a sporting one. We're developing a sports line with BT's Hunter in Vietnam as well. And all of these are designed to be purchased uh, online so that users know it will work with their product. In terms of where we are in the market, um, we are the one of the lowest cost and highest function products out there. Um, it's easy to customize. We have a remote distribution method that almost no one else can match. All the parts can be shipped out. Two minutes left. Okay. In terms of markets, um, the current projected market is 12.3 billion in 2025. That looks only at the developed world where there are between 4.5 to 10 million amputees. The developing world is 95% unexplored and it has 40 million amputees. That's the market we're looking to crack. Uh, our business model, it looks very complex, but basically someone gives us money, someone puts a prosthetic onto the user, and then that user will come back for the rest of their life buying upgrades and accessories. Uh, well, there's the social impacts quite obvious. We work with local corporate partners. They fund the prosthetic, the user works for them, and uh, we get paid for the product. Traction, we have, well, lots of awards. Um, we've got users already. We've done our soft launch. Our hard launch is in three weeks. Uh, and finally, our challenges. So as we're very near to launch, creating and running the smooth ordering system and production system is uh, going to be a challenge. We've just got ISO 9000, so working on that. Establishing a reliable distribution network. We have people who want to buy the product. We just have to get it to them efficiently. Getting reliable suppliers for electronics is a real challenge here. Um, and connecting with medical insurance providers. Our KPIs for the next few months, we're starting low. The goal is to sell 15 units by the end of 2020. We reckon that we can probably do that before the end of 2020, but we're being conservative. 
Maintenance, all of our user problems should be resolved in under two weeks. I want 80% for that. Uh, eight clinics signed on and active. And for the product, we want to have 12 color ranges, two extra accessory or modules in the market, and our app deployed. Uh, that's it. 14 seconds left. All right. There, there are more slides, but I think I'll, I'll cut it off there. <laughs> Thank you, Rafael. I think we have a lot of numbers from you. Uh, maybe, oh, yep. Uh, do we have any questions for Vulcan? Any of our partners? Nothing? Oh, we love questions. Come on. I think we, we will have questions for you guys. I think they're very cautious of the time because we have another thing that's right. Yeah, yeah, it has it's been running right. a bit behind and it's end of the day as well, especially in Korea, yeah. so. Uh, okay. So, yeah, yeah, thank you, Rafael. Um, I think we have live chair uh, going up now. Live chair, are you guys yep. here? I'm here. All right, so I'll sign off then. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you. Great. Are you guys seeing this view okay? Yep. Uh, we'll start. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Min Gun Kim. I am manager of LifeChair. Uh, LifeChair is an early startup. We protect precious lives and create safety culture. I would like to ask you guys a simple question, uh, question well, when I'm starting this presentation, like where do you guys find a seatbelt in a car? Like everyone can tell, like we can find our seatbelts right next to the car seat. Unfortunately, up on the boat, the situation is like not as same as a car. You have to go all the way through the hall to just find a life jacket. And the place is called Life Box. The problem is, 71% of the people who ride on a boat don't know where the life jackets are. And the number of deaths without life jacket is seven to 20 times higher than the one who didn't wear. So we think life jacket is a thing that we should be available to obtain easy and fast, like any time. Our uh, biggest challenge about this uh, business is uh, regulations. Like Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries are by uh, changing their regulations biannually, but other on the other hand, it, there is a great opportunity that uh, additional placement of life vests, like 110 percent more of total capacity and mandatory placements has increased, and durability for um, life uh, life jacket has increased into 10 years. Uh, we have to, and second challenge that we have right now is uh, we have to satisfy the needs of all involved person, safety for the passengers, efficiency for the ship owners, and immediacy for the rescue team. So we try to solve this problem by uh, talking with uh, former uh, 911 special rescue team and safety experience firefighter, uh, and we find out that the point is simplifying the safety equipment acquisition process. Like original process was seven to 10 steps, but when we use our product, it only takes four steps and the time is much more faster. What we do is we use the instinctual behavior by grabbing the life jacket right away. It's, I don't know if you guys can see, like it's, we can put up the life vest up on the chair like this. All we have to do is grab it and wear it right up on the head and we can be ready for the situation, like emergency situations. So the material that we used into our life jacket, the inside we're using a MBR, which is a yoga mat material. And outside is a, a we call it a Lycra, which is we're using into a wetsuit material. And the most important thing that we uh, put in the scientific way is we have a drowning prevention, which is like when you jump out from the boat, people can uh, knock into the water by head and they can lose their uh, 
uh, mind, and we have a self uh, scientific way to uh, guide our respiratory system out of the water. And the price wise, we only cost uh, $134, which compares to $250 uh, or if there is a safety certification. And any other uh, products that are going on th through the market, they, are, they don't have a safety certification. So we have a, a huge differences between the products. Our KPI and goals for quarter four, fourth quarter is we're going to obtain the safety certification and we're going to enter a domestic and overseas markets by end of this fourth quarter. We're currently working with uh, Ulsan Port Authority and uh, Yosu Gwangyang Port Authority as a domestic wise. And overseas, we have a uh, MOU with a red and white fleet and we're con currently uh, collaborating with the camping world about our products. How we measure KPI and goal is uh, the most important thing about the life jacket is uh, certification. And average time for acquisition in domestic is two years and overseas is 1.5 years. We are almost there. We will be able to finish our certification end of the November this year. And after when we're done with it, we're going to get a SOLAS which goes with a domestic and uh, only additional for the USCGs. And since we have a network with uh, shipping companies, accelerators, and uh, agency for the certification, so we'll be ready. So only thing that we have to remember is sit and survive. Thank you. Thank you, Mingan. I personally have a lot of questions for you guys, yep. um, especially with the pricing and the certification and how that relates to like how much about, but I don't think we could, but I think we can cover it. Um, like we will have our one-on-one -on -one RA meetings. So thank you for your presentation. Does anyone else have a question that they want to ask? I see that we also have other experts and judges who joined us. Uh, it's okay. We can go over a, a little bit at a time. No. If not, thank you, Life Chair and Genealogy. You guys have been waiting for a very long time. Uh, the floor is now yours. If Mingun, you could uh, stop sharing your screen. Oh, yeah, sorry. And Genealogy, are you guys here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, give me one sec. I'm trying to share my screen here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Okay. So I'm Andrew from Genealogy. We're AI-based DNA prediction and analysis uh, platform. And um, do you know anybody who has received a, a transplant or who needs a, a bone marrow or organ transplant? Actually, there are about 3.5 million patients in the U.S. either have received uh, these uh, transplants or uh, are in, uh, in need of these uh, transplants. So once they're diagnosed uh, for the fi first five years, they spend about $1.5 million dollars Exclude, excluding the uh, cost of the surgery. Um, so the patients who need uh, the transplants, uh, they have diverse uh, different diseases, but uh, they go through a very similar process. They have to uh, get a very expensive genetic testing to see if they could find the best matching among their family or non-family members. Uh, the lucky patients who uh, ultimately get the, uh, the transplants, uh, they go through very similar complications as well. And if the complications gets worse, they repeat the process uh, over and over again. So the first problem is there are different types of genetic tests, uh, tests uh, currently. Uh, the one that you see uh, over the counter in the US or in the Europe is uh, a SNP test. It only tests a point uh, three, uh, 0.3 percent of your whole genome, so you don't get yeah, the necessary uh, high-resolution uh, information you need 
for the, the transplant patients. And the, uh, the, the high resolution tests uh, that are being used is really expensive and it takes uh, about five to 10 days. So um, a patient needs to, uh, it's recommended to have their at least 10, 10 family members uh, tested, uh, but it's not covered by the insurance. So it, the cost, the total cost could go over well over $10,000. And the second problem is after spending close to $10,000, the likelihood of you finding a match in your family is only 30%. So you have to rely on uh, the government entities such as uh, 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 national donor organizations. And um, there, are, there are about 250 of these uh, organizations throughout the world. Uh, but uh, the likelihood of the patient finding a, uh, a perfect match donor uh, uh, in that database is really low. And lastly, even if you get the, the transplant uh, uh, surgeries, uh, more than 95% of the patients go through uh, complications, which could uh, be predicted. So our solution is we provide affordable testing using uh, a SNP uh, data, which you can find anywhere, uh, pretty much anywhere in the US, in Canada and Europe uh, currently. And with that whole genome uh, database, we provide AI-based donor matching algorithm. And lastly, in order to prevent any um, emergency situation, we provide health, a digital healthcare uh, platform for the uh, transplant patients. So our key technology is what we call the HLA imputation. It's a machine learning um, a prediction algorithm. So like I said, the, the SNP data is only 0.3% of your whole genome. So you have a lot of missing uh, pieces of information here and there. Uh, so we use our uh, uh, AI uh, prediction model to fill in, this, uh, uh, fill in these gaps. And currently our um, accuracy is 97.4% for uh, um, Caucasian and 98% for Asian population. And second key technology is the current test is, is it only looks at a certain region of your whole uh, uh, DNA, uh, but our, because we have the whole genome information, we look at whole genome um, data so that uh, we, we can provide a higher survival rate for the transplant patients. And lastly, um, these 3.5 million patients, uh, they go through many different um, uh, complications. They have two choices. If they think it's emergency uh, situation, they go to ER, emer emergency room uh, to get treated. Or if they feel it's not uh, an urgent, um, there are uh, thousands of uh, uh, these uh, uh, social network groups where they share information. And this is really risky. So we provide uh, a patient action plan, which is uh, pre-approved by the physician so that they know exactly uh, what can happen in the next uh, month or uh, coming weeks in advance. So there are many uh, bioinformatics or biotech companies out there, but um, uh, many companies only focus either on genetics or digital healthcare platform. But our, our, we are serving um, our hybrid model. We utilize the, the DNA data and bring a digital healthcare platform for the user. So, and we're targeting specifically for the transplant of patients. So uh, we're consisted of seven uh, professionals, uh, both from bioinformatics and healthcare system. Um, healthcare system, understanding healthcare system is, uh, is really important because uh, no matter how good the technology is, if uh, you can't uh, charge your insurance to pay for it, uh, the patients cannot use it. So uh, we emphasize on the technology as well as uh, getting the, the the, the cost paid by the insurance on behalf of the patients. And our current challenge is like any other uh, startups out there, uh, COVID-19 is our biggest uh, challenge. 
because initially we had a plan to um, target the t top 10 uh, blood cancer hospitals in the U.S., but all these offline uh, campaigns got canceled due to COVID-19. So that's our biggest challenge. And um, our KPI, main, main KPI is uh, uh, having our uh, 200 HLA database uh, because uh, our goal is to uh, reach 99% by next year. So this is really crucial to improve our accuracy. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Any questions? Any questions, especially about uh, some difficult scientific uh, things? I think we might have some separate questions for you, uh, maybe not at this time right away. Um, but if anyone has, feel free to cut me off. If not, then uh, we will close uh, with genealogy and move on to our entire session. I'm going to send the link in this chat here. Everyone should have gotten it now. Uh, please move on to the RA introduction, like the in-depth introduction session that we will uh, be doing. All right. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Please copy paste the link and click or click on it. Okay, I'm going to be closing the room. Bye-bye.